I get into my talk, let's just kind of transition because you've probably been coming from classes, I've been coming from work. But I have a question for you because you're in science and we use a lot of symbols and abbreviations in science. So I just want to know if you're familiar with this one. Well, it's actually the symbol for female. But what if you're an astronomer? Which planet is this? Venus. Yes, it is. So that's Venus. Very good. Okay. Number two. It's male. <laughs> if you're an astronomer, which planet? Okay. I didn't tell you this, but in another life, I ran the planetarium in the Science Center at the University of Arizona. So I have a big love of astronomy. So yes, this is Mars. So here's the third one. What do you think, hermaphrodite? <laughs> Transgender? Saturn? I have no idea. <laughs> but it's on every wafer of every Oreo cookie I've ever eaten. <laughs> if you don't believe me, check it out. And I'll see one. Okay. Serious, serious. Okay, I mentioned astronomy and I mentioned the U of A, and I just want to quickly tell you a story. So. When they were going to build the Hubble telescope, the hardware for the telescope was built in one place, but NASA contracted with the University of Arizona to pour the mirror. And of course, the mirror is molten glass that you then have to let it cool, and you can't speed up that cooling process, and you can't have vibrations during the cooling process if you want it to be uniform and smooth and give you the refractive quality that you need. So you have nine months of cooling for the Hubble telescope mirror. No vibration. Where on the campus of the University of Arizona are you going to pour that mirror and let it cool? It's a bigger campus, bigger population than here. Well, what's incredible is they built the telescope mirror lab under the football stadium at the University of Arizona. Because for nine months of the year, they don't play games there. <laughs> it's okay if the marching band practices, not enough vibration. But they can't have 50,000 people in the stands. That's too much. So they poured it beginning of January, and it was hardened by the end of August, early September, just in time for kickoff. And it's up there in space doing its thing. <laughs> so sometimes I just want you to remember creativity is a really important part of problem solving. OK? But other times, you're taking a risk when you're doing when you're the first to do something. And it's cool to take risks, within reason, but it's cool to take risks. So how many of you are familiar with the American hero, John Glenn? All right, so John Glenn was the first astronaut to orbit the Earth for the US. Yuri Gagarin had already done it for the then Soviet Union. But Glenn was the first U.S. astronaut, and he was in a Mercury capsule, really tight, really confined space. He did three orbits of the Earth, successfully re-entered, splashed down. He ended up having a career as an astronaut, was a U.S. senator from Ohio, and was the oldest man to ever fly on one of the space shuttles before he died. John Glenn has a great quote when he was waiting on the launch pad for that Mercury rocket to blast off. His quote is, all I kept thinking is every part on this ship was submitted by the lowest bidder. <laughs> and that's what happens when you work in government. So he had good reason to be a little nervous about whether this is going to work or not. But it did. Well, I'm here today to talk to you a bit about energy and from Idaho Power's point of view, we're your electric utility, so we're the company responsible for keeping the lights on. And I'm going to talk to you about how we do that and 
some of the concerns associated with the way we do that and what we're trying to do about those concerns. Okay, it's not a perfect system. And I'm here to have a good, interactive conversation with you about that, okay? So, we're gonna talk about energy and the ability to perform work, as you know, that's really what energy is defined as. And there's many different types of energy, but we're going to primarily, first we're gonna look at thermal, because we burn coal and we burn natural gas to produce electricity, so thermal's important. So it is the motion of microscopic particles such as atoms and molecules. I want you to understand that heat is really, and temperature really is measuring how fast a particle is moving. So I know you normally think about it is, is it hot or cold? Well, in science, there's no such thing as cold. There's only hot and less hot. Cold would be the absolute absence of any motion. And I'm talking all the way to the atomic level. And what would that temperature be if you got an atom to completely stop moving? What's that? Absolute zero. Absolute zero. Yes. Well, I want you to think about something. If you, if you just cooked a steak in the grill and something happens and you can't eat it right now, so you throw it in your fridge to keep it fresh, you're expecting the refrigerator to extract the heat from that steak and bring it down to a certain temperature, probably 40 degrees, to keep bacteria from growing on it. You think about it pulling the heat out, and the heat goes out the back of the refrigerator, right? What it's really doing is slowing the molecular motion, and that's what's causing it to drop in temperature. If I wanted to drop it less than 40, I'd put it in the freezer, which is better at extracting heat and causing things to slow down. But the point is, the only way I can get something to go from hot to less hot is to surround hot with less hot. Then the particles slow down, the heat transfers, and it becomes less hot. So if this is absolute zero and I want to attain it, we have gotten really close in the lab. But will we ever reach absolute zero? The answer is no, because we would have to put whatever it is we want it to be at absolute zero in an environment that is less than absolute zero. And I can't even get to absolute zero. We got really close though. Even outer space, there is motion, there is heat, it is not absolute zero. Does that make sense? Okay, I, I just found when I first learned that, I thought that was pretty fascinating. And you can, but it's a lot about thermodynamics in that, in that brief explanation. Okay, now we're gonna talk about electrical energy. So the word, you know, science, we can trip over words a lot, but if you take the time to break them down, you'll usually find out the word is from Latin or Greek, and it'll make sense to you if you break it down. So thermodynamics is changing in heat. Now I understand thermodynamics better. Yeah, it's a change in heat. Because remember, cold doesn't exist. Okay, so electrical energy is a flow of electrons. That's a Greek word. And all I'm doing is trying to get the electrons to flow. Now nature does this in a lightning bolt. And it will cause electrons to flow at the speed of light, tremendous voltage, and it provides a lot of heat. We try to do it at the power company and provide it to you by getting electrons to move, but instead of like a lightning bolt where it's wireless and completely free, we put it inside something. So we find a, a conductor, copper, aluminum, gold, and then we seal that in something made of plastic or rubber that doesn't allow electrons to flow, an insulator, and that's how we make it so you can take the plug put it into the wall, and you never come in contact with the electrons, which then start flowing. I know it's basic, but 
I want you to get to that thinking so that this will make more sense to you. So originally, aluminum was pretty cheap and we wired houses in the early 20th century, 1910, 1920, we wired houses with aluminum until we figured out that if you left something plugged in too long, the flow of electrons caused the aluminum to heat up so much, it went through the insulation, it went into the wall, into the wood, and it caused house fires. Many people lost their lives. So they started saying, we better find something else. Nobody said don't use electricity anymore because they liked the convenience. So they started using copper, which is still pretty affordable, but it doesn't heat up as much. And most of the wiring in use today is copper. However, if you want the electrons to flow really quickly, you don't use copper. You use gold, silver, or platinum which is why your iPhone costs so much, but which is why it works so quickly. We are creatures of convenience, and we would get frustrated if there's browsing time, or it just takes a long time to download. So Apple fills this phone with silver, gold, and platinum. And you know, they do the nicest thing for you. Let's say your phone's old and you're gonna upgrade bring it to the Apple store, we'll take care of it for you, we'll recycle it for you. They're gonna go in the back, they're gonna send it to Cupertino, and they're gonna take this thing apart and they're gonna mine the gold, silver, and platinum because those are really expensive to get on the open market. And there's a lot of what are called rare earth metals in this phone as well that are needed. They don't wanna lose those and it's cheaper to get them from your phone than it is to get them from the Democratic Republic but this is full of gold, silver, and platinum. And Bill Gates, founder of Microsoft, he has a beautiful home in uh, Washington, near Seattle, and his home is wired with gold wire. Why? <laughs> Three words, because he can. <laughs> That's a true story. Okay, so it's a really good conductor. Two types of electrical energy. So I talked about lightning. That's static electricity. What I mean by that is it stays still. Stasis, no motion. Until it builds up such a charge that all at once it moves. So when you rub your feet against the floor in winter time when the heat's on and there's not much moisture in the air to draw the electricity off, you're building up a charge and then if you touch a light switch, you may get a small spark. That's a jump, that's static electricity. When the sweater and the socks get attached in the clothes dryer, and you peel them apart, that's static electricity. The lightning bolt is from literally the clouds rubbing together, creating a charge, it builds up, it builds up, boom, it goes down to earth. You see it as lightning. You hear the thunder, and what is the thunder? It's kind of cool. When you put an electrical stream with that much voltage, that much heat, going at the speed of light, from a cloud to the ground, or from the ground to the cloud, it happens both ways, you are going to heat the air that's in between, so much so that when things heat, they expand, and as soon as the lightning bolt is through, back together and you hear it as a clap. And the thunder is always after the lightning because sound travels slower than light. <coughs> Sometimes you never even hear, you see lightning up in the sky, we call it heat lightning, but you never hear thunder. It's because they're traveling at such a small distance, it's not creating enough of a clap for you to hear it. Does that make sense? It's a lot more complicated than this, but, but this is all true, what I'm telling you, okay? So, that's what happens. If you want to be the next Bill Gates or Steve Jobs, you bottle a lightning bolt, because there's enough energy in one bolt of lightning to power the entire Earth. We just haven't figured out how to capture it and maintain it 
without it getting away. And here's the other crazy fact. There is a lightning strike on the Earth every second of every day. Somewhere in the Earth right now, lightning is striking. Now it's there. Now it's there. Now it's there. If you could figure out a device that could capture that lightning, you would have a worldwide customer base, and you could wire your house with coal. <laughs> but that's all serious fact. We just can't control it. We can't contain it. It's too much at one time. But boy, if we could, wow. So here's lightning. It's always unpredictable. You can't say that the bolt is going to go in a straight line because you don't know what's in the air that's attracting the electrons. Remember, it's a negative charge. They circle the outside of the atom. They're all negative, so they try to get away from each other. So when you build them up in a cloud and they're trying to get away from each other, the biggest place in the world for them to go to get away from each other is the ground. And that's why the lightning strikes normally go from cloud to ground. And as soon as they hit the ground, the electrons spread out because they can get away from each other. Everything's cool. But if you're in the path of that, forget it. If you're a tree, you're cut down. If you're a person, you're dead. If you're a house, you're probably caught on fire. That's what's going on, and that's why in, electri in electronics, there's three, there's three uh, holes in the wall outlet, and there's three plugs on the plug. The one that's not like the other two, that's the grounding plug that sends any extra electrons, yep, right to ground. That's where the expression comes from. Okay. Current electricity is electricity that's flowing like a current or a river. This is the electricity we deliver to you. It doesn't stop. Well, it really does. But for the most part, it's flowing. It's moving. So the current electricity is continuous movement from one point to another. Direct current, I only let it go from this direction to there. It's one direction. If it's alternating current, I'm having it go back and forth. So Thomas Edison, great inventor, known for a lot of things, he messed with electricity and he wanted to power cities with batteries, direct current batteries. Every other block in New York City, he proposed a big battery that put out electrons and would cover two block radius and you could power things. But you'd have to have this battery, and it was big, on every city block, every two blocks. There was a Serbian immigrant by the name of Nikola Tesla who came over, and he took Edison up on a challenge. Edison had a transformer for the city of New York, and he put out, he put out a, uh, oh, a challenge said, if you can make this transformer more efficient, I will pay you $50,000. Tesla heard about that challenge, went, looked at the transformer, spent a couple weeks, came back and submitted to Edison a plan for making that transformer much more efficient. This has all been documented. What he wrote down was correct. It would work. He wasn't allowed to implement it. And what they don't tell you in the history books is that Edison said to Tesla, I'm not going to pay you. You're new to America. Don't believe everything you read. Well, Tesla continued his work on electricity. He sent, he lit a light bulb in Boulder, Colorado from a source 150 miles away, no wires. We still don't know how he did it. People are trying to reproduce that today. He experimented with what's called ball lightning. And if you don't know what that is, that's a great Google topic. And he said, no, the proper way to provide electricity is alternating current. Because if I have the current go back and forth, I can have it go for a much greater distance before it loses its push or its voltage. And then it doesn't work as well. Edison's direct current was great, but it's only for short distances. And think about it. There is a battery in this pointer. 
All it has to do is move electrons from the battery to, a, to some type of electrical device right here. It's what, probably a quarter inch away. That's direct current. You got a flashlight, you put batteries in it, you don't expect those electrons to go far to get to the light bulb to illuminate the flashlight. But if you want something to last and stay on, you use alternating current. And what you do is you get them to move back and forth. So you actually get the electrons in that wire to go this way and then this way. And the 60 hertz up there, Hertz was a German scientist, the 60 hertz says, I'm going to make those electrons go back and forth 60 times a second. So, remember when I said current electricity is usually moving? What happens when I get to here and I now push the electrons this way? There is a very brief period of time where the electron's not moving. And you guys may not, most of you may not be old enough to remember this, but Don, you and I can remember it. Oh, okay. Older fluorescent fixtures, they used a magnetic ballast to power the light. And when the light was starting to go bad, not only did it change color and it kind of got a pink hue to it, it would flicker. What you were seeing is when the electrons weren't moving, you could see when it wasn't powering the light. Because all these fluorescent bulbs are full of gas and I'm sending electrons in this way and I'm taking them out that way and they energize the gas as they travel through it. But when I make the electrons go the other way, there's a brief period of time where they're not energizing that gas. Well, what they do with these new ballasts is they make that from 60 hertz to over 100,000 hertz. So in every second, these lights are off 100,000 times. Your eye can't distinguish that, so to us, we think the light is always on. But now you know it really isn't. And if you go into an older building with the fatter tubes, and you can hear that when you turn the lights on, that's a magnetic ballast, wait till those lights start to go, and you'll be able to see when the electrons aren't moving. So my power company pushes electrons through wires. That's what we do for a living. And we push it this way, then we bring it back this way. 60 times a second. Now you gotta be different, right? Europe is 50 times a second. So, who's traveled overseas? Okay, so if you decide, you know, I'd like my hair to look good when I'm over there, I'm gonna take a hair dryer with me. A US hair dryer needs 60 hertz. You take it to Europe, it's not going to work nearly as well. It's only getting 50. You bring a European hair dryer over to the US, it'll burn it out. It's used to 50 hertz, not 60. So they now, they, well, they now, they have for years. They sell an adapter that converts it, okay? But that's why. I don't know why we don't have uniformity, but we can't even work out trade negotiations. So I guess that's should be Okay, so you got the difference between static and current, right? And we do a lot of things with current, a lot more than we do static. So there's the battery, and you know you got to put the battery in the right way. That's because it only lets the electrons move in one direction. Here, I'm allowing an electron to go in, and then it comes back out on the other prong. So I need two prongs. And the third prong would be the ground for any excess energy. <coughs> okay. So there's a description. There's DC. The electrons are only going one way. Alternating, they're going back and forth. Why are gold, silver, and platinum better conductors than copper? They are further down the periodic table of elements. They have more orbitals of electrons. And the further out you go as an orbital from the nucleus, the easier it is move those electrons to steal an electron and then replace it with something else. So you've got all of these atoms of gold next to each other and all we're doing at the electric company is starting a domino effect. You push an electron and it bounces from one to the other, but it does it because the nucleus can't take a hold on that electron for gold 
nearly as well as it can for aluminum. Does that make sense? Okay, there's a reason for that periodic table. If you can master that table, I'm telling you, it'll serve you the rest of your life. Mendeleev was a genius, and he figured out that table when there were only about 40 known elements, and he had holes everywhere, but he knew there's an atom there, just haven't discovered it yet. There's an element that I haven't discovered. We're now over 120 elements. Anyway, there's a reason why um, as the lower you go, the more electrons you have. So, I set the record straight with these two guys. Yeah, I know. Edison probably had a better hairstyle, but come on. <laughs> so, Elon Musk names his company after Tesla because he understood the role Tesla played. He's the father of alternating current. By the way, he also has now posthumously been issued the patent for radio. Marconi, an Italian scientist, got the patent and Tesla said he stole my work and after Tesla died, they agreed. So he is now credited with the father of radio. You just don't hear much about him. He's, he was quite a guy. He went through 20 napkins at a meal. He would not touch people. But he kept pigeons in his apartment. It doesn't make sense. <laughs> but when a guy's got genius like this, you kind of just let him go. <laughs> you want to eat Captain Crunch for dinner? Go right ahead. <laughs> so that's what's going on here. So how do we do it? It's really not that complicated. How do we get that progression of electrons to move? Well, I need to put a magnet around a generator. And as you know, if you wrap a nail with wire and connect it to an electrical source, you'll make that nail magnetic. You're messing with the charge. One end of the nail is positive, one end is negative, you now have made a magnet. We surround this generator with magnets so that when it spins, it's creating a charge and we're pushing the <coughs> electrons into wire and sending them out to you. How do we get this to turn? Well, I connect it to a shaft, and at the bottom of the shaft, I have propeller blades, they're known as wickets, and we put them in a river because the river's already flowing. Take advantage of that, and I let it move the turbine, which turns the shaft, which turns the generator, which pushes the electrons. That's how we bring electricity to you. If I wanted to, to create more, I build a dam so that behind the dam, the water's up here, my turbine is down at the base of the dam, I've got head pressure coming down, it's gonna force that turbine to spin faster than the current of the river, that's why I build a dam, and that's why I get more electricity from it. Does that make sense? Okay, how does a wind turbine work? Same way, we're just not using water, we're using air to turn the turbine. How does a natural gas plant work? You're burning natural gas to create energy and heat, and you're boiling water, and you let the water convert to steam, and the steam pushes the turbine blades, and that's how you generate electricity. Coal plant, same way. Now, here's the question. How does a nuclear plant work? Are we really splitting the atom to boil water to move a turbine? It's pretty close to that. It's really efficient, but that's really what's going on in an atomic plant. The problem is you've got the fuel rods and the residue of radioactive materials that you've got to hang on to for a couple thousand years. The Idaho National Lab in eastern Idaho in Idaho Falls is working on small, <coughs> very small, highly condensed nuclear reactors, and I think they are going to become part of the energy system in the future. Nothing wrong with nuclear. I'm, I'm not against it. We don't use it. France, 40% of its energy comes from nuclear power. It's proven. It works. But what I'm telling you is you're splitting the atom to generate heat boil water to create steam to move a turbine 
to push electrons. It's complicated, but that's the basic system, okay? So, what's our core business? Well, I either burn natural gas or I burn coal to move the turbine or I use a hydro dam and we're putting the electrons in those wires and then we put them into what's called a step-up transformer which pushes and increases the voltage because the voltage is the push on the flow of electrons. The flow is the amperage. The resistance from the wire is measured in ohms, but the push on the electrons is voltage. So if I've got to get electrons from Hell's Canyon, which is the deepest gorge in North America on the Oregon border, but I've got three big hydroelectric plants there, if I want to get the electrons from there to here, I need to step it up and use a lot of voltage so that they move and they don't lose their energy on the way. That's what a step-up transformer does. I use these big transmission lines because I got to keep it high above the ground because it's high voltage and if you get in near that, it's going to jump, it's going to kill you, it's going to burn things, etc. So we elevate them. Then we bring them to a substation which basically says, okay, now we're going to, we're going to reduce the voltage because we don't want to overwhelm a home or a business and then we're going to power the homes and the businesses. And then that electron that's moving at 60 times a second goes backwards back to the power plant. Now it may not make it all the way back to the power plant because on its way back it's getting pushed the other way. Remember it happens 60 times a second. So the electrons in many times, those electrons are the same electron getting pushed around makes sense? I, I, it's kind of crazy to visualize and think about it, and we don't normally think about this stuff. And you're probably saying, yeah, you're darn right I don't, and it's a good thing I don't. But this is kind of like really what it's, what's happening, okay? So, we also have people now who are independently saying, I don't need idle power. I'm going to generate my own electricity. Good for them. They have every legal right to do it and there's economic savings if they do it, so they're doing it. So if you drive from Boise towards Mountain Home, you'll see a big solar array on the south side of the highway. That's private. We buy every bit of electricity from that array. That's not ours. If you keep going on 84, you'll see wind turbines. That's private. We buy that electricity, but it's not ours. Now why don't we do solar and wind? Because we're really good at hydro and we're letting private enterprise work on other forms like solar, wind, anaerobic digestion. You know, there are dairy farms in Jerome and Twin Falls that are taking cow manure, letting bacteria break it down, they give off methane gas, they capture it, they burn it, they boil water, they move a turbine, and they generate electricity. Good for them. It's better than letting it sit in a pond, which is what the alternative has been. And if you, you know about Hurricane Florence a couple weeks ago. There's a lot of pig farms in North Carolina with open manure pits, and those got flooded, and now they're in the river water. Had they had anaerobic digestion, that would have all been contained, and we wouldn't have that problem. This is good stuff. Is it competing with my company? Absolutely. Oh well, this is America. We have to deal with these things and be flexible. Why do we buy all that energy? Not because we're nice guys. We buy it because we're federally obligated to buy it. There was a law passed in 1978 during an old oil crisis that I can remember. And President Carter at the time said, we ought to encourage people to make their own electricity so we don't rely on foreign oil as much. It just didn't get utilized very much until about 10 years ago. So now, you have all these different ways of generating electricity, even geothermal. How simple is this? I let the earth boil the water. All I do is put a pipe in the ground, bring the steam up, move a turbine, pipe it back in, the earth heats it up again, it's a continuous cycle. There's no pollution. It's reliable because the earth hasn't cooled off yet. 
It's genius. We have that in, in Idaho. We have the only state capitol building that's heated with the geothermal heat associated with Yellowstone. Warm Springs Avenue, those homes are heated by geothermal. So why not put a pipe in the ground and try to grab that steam that nature's already producing for you? So you also have farmers who have their own canal system. They're starting to put small turbines in those canals. Great, good for them. The city of Portland has tried this. There's some really tall office buildings, 30, 40 stories high, in the water pipes they've put turbines. So that as the water moves, they're also generating electricity. The next step is they're going to put it in the sewer pipes. So when you flush the toilet, it's gravity fed. You may as well take advantage of the flow of water, just like in a river, and they're going to make electricity from it. Let your minds go. There are so many opportunities for you with energy generation. And what, guess what? Utility has to buy it from you. So you have a customer. You just have to figure out the technology. And that's why you're getting your degree here, right? <laughs> See, I will tie it in. <laughs> Battery storage. So here's the other thing. OK, so I promote electric vehicles. I drove one over here. You know that they've got batteries in them. And those batteries right now, the lifespan is about 8 to 10 years. So what happens when the battery goes down even to like 80% of its charge level? The manufacturer will tell you, got to replace the battery, the car's not going to operate the way you expect it to. It's not our fault, the battery is starting to lose its ability to store energy. It's still got 80%. So last year we invited the head of sustainability for Ford Motor Company to talk to our board here in Boise. And I asked the question, what are you going to do when people come back to your dealerships and say, I need to replace my battery? What are you going to do with the old battery? It's the same thing that Apple does with the old phone. He said, we're going to pull that battery and we're going to sell it to people to put in their garage so if they have a solar panel, they can now store that energy and use that energy overnight. Well, you should have seen the looks on our board members when they said that. That's a threat to our business. But you know what? It's a capitalist economy. Deal with it. So we have to figure that out. But the Tesla wall, you've heard of that storage capability? It's just battery storage. But nobody has perfected battery storage. So here's your second chance to become another Bill Gates. Figure out a storage battery that would let us take that wind power and solar power that we buy, but we may not need it at the time it's generated, and let me store that for two or three months and use it when I do need it. If you, if you do that, you will have customers around the world, and you'll be set. And I'm telling you, the answer is not lithium ion batteries, which is what's being used right now. Lithium is, is growing more scarce. It's also mined in countries that don't have the most stable government, so you have to worry about your supply chain. They're looking at nickel, but there's a whole lot of other elements on that periodic table. It's worth a look. Yes, sir. So iPhone power does have a lot of things. We have um, 17. Yeah. Say that a lot. Yep. Um, <laughs> so have you guys looked into, I, maybe you already knew this, but I've heard of Is basically just taking power that they've gotten from wind or solar or something like that, and if they're not able to use it immediately, to take that water, pump it up into a reservoir, and basically store the energy that way. And then let it flow when we do need it so it goes through the turbines. Yes. It's a great idea. It's called pump storage. We have not thought of it as far as, in a, as pumping it uphill into a new reservoir, because I don't think we'd ever get the environmental permit to make a new reservoir. But here's what we have thought of, and we're looking at right now. So I talked to you about Hell's Canyon, that gorge between Idaho and Oregon. We have three dams in that canyon. So this is Idaho, this is Oregon, the river flows this way. I got a dam here, a dam here, and a dam here. Behind each of these dams, I have a reservoir. 
So, gee, let me put the water through here, through the turbine, to create electricity, and immediately pump it back into this reservoir. There's my pump storage. And I'm only moving it less than 100 feet. And I'm not moving it up a hill. I'm moving it up because this water level is higher than this, but it's more contained. That's the pump storage that we would be looking at. But we actually would rather wait until technology develops a better storage battery. Hint, hint, <laughs> that's your opportunity. I'm serious. So I'm going to tell you one last story, and then I'll be done, and I'll take your questions. So Idaho is kind of known as a pretty rural state. and. I was in Manhattan two weeks ago talking with Wall Street analysts about our stock, because we're publicly traded, and our sustainability work. And I joked with them and I said, half of you guys think Idaho is somewhere on the Mississippi River, because they get us mixed up with Iowa. And they laughed and some of them said, yeah, I've made that mistake. So a lot of people don't know about Idaho. There's a country song about a flyover state, we're a flyover state. That's okay. You live here, you understand, kind of like it that way. <laughs> World War II. World War II. We're fighting the Axis armies. We're using lead bullets, just like they are, in the rifles. This is going to sound really archaic. But a lot of it was shooting with a rifle. But a lead bullet, as you can imagine, when it hits a tank, smashes and it may dent the tank, but it's not going to pierce it. So your gun against a tank is pretty useless. Unless you coat the tip of that lead bullet with antimony, which is an element from the periodic table, and there happens to be a source of it. The ore is called stibnite, and that's an area north of McCall in an area called Yellow Pine. Any of this sound familiar? It's rural. We had a stibnite mine. That's the SB for stibnite. We had a stibnite mine run by the U.S. government here in Idaho during World War II. And if you worked in that mine, you were exempt from the draft because you were already helping your country. And we mined antimony and sent it to the bullet makers, and they co coated the lead bullets, and now it would pierce a tank. Well. The Nazi Germans needed antimony for their lead bullets. There's no stibnite in Germany or in any of the occupied countries, Czechoslovakia at the time, France, Austria, the Baltics, none of it. So they had to go somewhere else to get antimony. Where they went is Argentina, and they opened up mines in Argentina for stibnite. And believe it or not, after World War II, many Nazis fled to Argentina. And about 15 years ago, the president of Argentina was of German descent. Elected, and he, he was the son of people who emigrated from Nazi Germany after the war because there were so many Germans in Argentina. One element, a use in war, but look at the effect it had around the world. I mean, World War II was pretty disastrous. And the mining that occurred just to get that element, just to use it for coating bullets. They use antimony for a lot of other things now. They've closed the mine in Stibnite, but there are people who would like to reopen it because there's molybdenum, manganese, Stibnite, there's a lot of elements there. They call this the gem state for a good reason. We've mined more gold and silver from Idaho than California and Nevada combined. There's a lot of valuable resources here, but we've got a lot of environmental protection. So, but This was a resource from years ago used to coat bullets, so that's the antimony. That's the antimony. It's the tip of the bullet. You don't need the whole thing. Just what hits first know that? Did you ever hear about that? I'm telling you, the periodic table, it, it'll give you a leg up. It's okay to be a nerd if you know the periodic table. It's kind of <laughs> okay, so that's the end of my presentation. I, I hope that I was able to relate electrical generation to you, how we do it, 
how other people are doing it and sending the power to us, and what opportunities there are for you as material science and, and engineer majors. Hello, John. Nice to see you. Great talk, man. <laughs> <laughs> it was compelling. <laughs> so, are there any questions that I can address for you? Yes. Uh, I have a question about the geothermal that you're talking about. Do you think it requires reheating when you do that? Like pulling the water from wood pipes into some generators or like turbines? Does it require like reheating? Or? It does not require reheating because it's at such a tremendous hot temperature. Now, you're going to have various temperatures depending on where you're extracting. But there's an area in Idaho called the Raft River which is in central, south central Idaho. They have a big geothermal plant there, but basically they pull it out of the ground. They don't have to reheat it. It goes through turbines and they immediately put it back into the ground. And it's really smart because it's just continuous. It doesn't generate any carbon emissions. So you call it clean, it's renewable. You can sell credits associated with it and it's reliable. You, you produce 24 hours a day. Wind energy is a great option, but you've got to wait for the wind to blow. So it's not as reliable as geothermal. Solar is great because it's on all day, but you do have times when it's diminished because of cloud cover. Or a year ago, August, when we had the total solar eclipse. So something that you may not know is we have people who buy and sell electricity to make up for shortfalls. And some people buy and sell it a day ahead, others an hour ahead, and some in 10 or 15 minute increments. Those folks were really busy a year ago when as the solar eclipse started to happen and it hit totality and then it waned, we were buying and selling electricity to keep everybody's lights on because the solar was diminished, but we had been relying on that, but we knew it was gonna diminish. So we could plan for it. What happens is when you have cloud cover, you don't know necessarily when it's going to diminish, and nobody really knows when the wind is going to suddenly stop blowing. So we have to have a backup for those kinds of sources. Geothermal is great because it's just going. It's just we don't have a lot of it. Yes? Um, this may be a bit fan, uh, fanciful, but um, is there any Digger down deeper? In, in theory, yes, you could dig down deeper. It's just how deep, how expensive is that? And there's a lot of materials involved in because you have to put pipe into that ground to, to bring the energy up in a in a directed manner. But in theory, you should be able to drill towards the hot of the earth anywhere on earth. It's just how expensive is it going to be? And what are you drilling through? Is it granite or is it some other geologic formation. Iceland has a lot of geothermal and it's pretty much near, closer to the surface, so they have a lot of geothermal energy for the, for the area. The hot springs that we have in Idaho, if you go to any of those hot springs, that's basically geothermal. Other questions? Sir? Uh, could you close the loop for me on, on the pump storage thing here? Yeah. I mean, that, you know, uh, I mean, obviously, that's not you got lost. So that's not your perpetual motion. Um, no. Are you are you executing that? The, the no. Question that the, we're not uh, executing. The, uh, the question the young man asked is: um, So you're saying you don't do that when you have an abundance of power in the grid from uh, from wind or other sources? At when this point, do we, we don't. Do that? We never do it. We haven't done it yet. I'm never saying, never. in okay. theory, if somebody asks us, "Are you guys looking into pump storage?" The answer is. Yes, but not in the traditional manner of, of putting up a reservoir higher up in the, in the mountains so that you get the head pressure when you let it down. Right. What we're doing is just saying, gee, maybe we just pump the water from this reservoir back up behind this dam. We have the head pressure already, and we're good. It would only make sense to ever do that if you, if you, had, an, if you had an abundance of flow and not, and not a, a demand for the energy. Does that happen, I guess is what I'm saying. It hasn't happened yet, because if time. we have an abundance, it's right now it's cheaper for us. At these dams, there's always what's called a spillway where you can let the water flow and it doesn't go through the turbines. We look at it as 
it's almost like taking gasoline and dumping it on the ground. That water is fuel for us, but we let it go through the spillway. That's a cheaper way when we are we have too much energy. Yeah, that rarely happens though. Am I correct? Well, if we do uh, our if we do our job right with these buyers and sellers, you're right. It doesn't happen a lot, but it can happen. And then we have these transmission lines that not only bring energy from our plants, but they bring energy from other utilities. So we kind of trade back and forth all the way all the way to Washington, California, so that we can always get energy or try to sell energy to them as well. Any, anybody here see that Die Hard movie? Uh, the one about the natural gas plant in West Virginia and they took out that part of the grid. Sorry, I love Bruce Willis, he's bald, I'm going bald, he's my hero, okay? Anyway, the point is, in the U.S., there are three electrical grids, for the most part. There's the western grid, which is west of the Mississippi, and everybody in that grid can literally, because electrons flow at the speed of light, I can move electrons from North Dakota to New Mexico. Probably don't have to, but I can. Then there's one east of the Mississippi, Maine to Florida, and then there's Texas. Texas is separate. <coughs> And it is not easy to send electrons into or out of Texas. That's how they set their system up. So they are kind of enclosed. But, so because we can talk to other utilities and buy and trade, it reduces the need for us to think about pump storage at this time. But it would cost us energy to move that water up. So we better be able to get that energy back when it goes through the turbine because it costs us money to do it. And we make money when we make the electricity, so economically it's got to make sense as well. You had a question? Uh, yeah, I kind of piggyback. Uh, with the growth and expansion that, that I was saying, I'm the mayor of so it's come back here from Texas, I think, 10 years. And it's grown quite a bit. Um, but as far as I know, power is concerned, they all have been that's a great question so we like every other utility every two years we go through a process called the integrated resource plan where we basically say okay 20 years from now 2038 what do we think the demand for electricity is going to be and how are we going to generate that electricity and then we sit down with all these different things saying well here are the plants we have right now do we need to build any? Do we think there's going to be a shortfall? Can we buy from the grid? That's exactly what we're going through right now. My personal opinion, we're not going to build another power plant. We shouldn't have to build another power plant if we do things right. It costs money, and as a utility though, and this is more of my work over at the College of Business and Economics, we get money when we build something because we get a return on that, okay? And we pass that on to customers. I don't think we need to do that. I don't think we're going to need to do that at least to generate electricity. So you're looking more at uh, um, improving existing. Improving. We keep our hydro. We try to keep it at state-of-the-art. We replace turbines, et cetera. But we also are integrating more of what the public is bringing to us, and it doesn't matter if we like that or not. We have to do it, so we're getting better at doing it. And we're also getting better. We are proposing to build a transmission line that would connect us better to the Pacific Northwest and another one that would connect us through Wyoming. I don't know if those are going to get approved, but those are things that we have already, we've, we've asked for those for about six years now. But I don't see us building another, we certainly won't build a coal plant. And I don't, we'd never get permitted for another hydro. And I don't see us building another gas plant, so honestly, I don't see us building another plant. If we do this right, we shouldn't have to. Gotcha. And that's good for customers. Nuclear. Nuclear? <laughs> no. But some, I can't tell you, but if some of these electrons right here, we buy electricity from Washington State, they have nuclear power. I can't tell you if some of these electrons didn't get pushed here from a nuclear plant. There's nobody who can tell you what's keeping these lights on right now. I have a pretty good guess because I know what our portfolio is, but nobody can tell you down to the down to the electron. Yes. So the current administration is a uh, big supporter of reinvigorating the coal uh, yes. market, and just wondering if you had an idea about how much of uh, Idaho Power's current offerings come from non-sustainable sources. 
Well, we have 18% come from coal and about eight, about 9% come from natural gas. And both of those are finite. And then about 50% comes from hydro. And then the rest come from what we buy from the public, from solar, wind, geothermal. And then we also buy off the transmission lines. So we have plans to get out of two of the three coal plants that we're co-owners of by 2025. And we've said that to Wall Street. <coughs> We're not going back on that. You can't do that when you're publicly traded. And it doesn't make business sense for us. There's the third plant is in Wyoming, and we're looking at the feasibility of that plant right now. I understand what the president wants to do to help the coal industry. I'm telling you, the people in the coal industry are telling you coal is on its way out. They realize it. I'll leave you with a quote. I started with John Glenn. I'll leave you with a former interior minister for Saudi Arabia, big oil country. 20 years ago, he said the Stone Age didn't end because we ran out of stones. And the oil age will not end because we run out of oil. He was saying they're going to be out of the oil business way before they've pumped everything from the ground. And it's starting to happen right now. And I think we're at that stage with coal as well. Thanks for your attention. I hope this was insightful, and uh, Penn State's got a really big game tomorrow. <laughs> so go Lions and go Broncos, okay?